All right, so uh, here's what we were talking about last time is polar coordinates. New way to think about uh, how to describe locations of points uh, in the uh, in the plane. Uh, but uh, let me remind you uh, what I want to strongly encourage you to do is don't think of them as in, you know in that sense. Think of them as a function, right? That uh, if you were to have a couple of r and theta coordinates, which you can think of as a point in the r theta plane. Right, um, then they can plug into this function, the polar coordinates function, and out comes, you know, by way of the usual construction, of course, um, a point in the x y plane. So think of it as a function from the r theta plane to the x y plane. Okay. Now, with that in mind, um, there's some uh, basic groundwork about polar coordinates that we just need to kind of get done. I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, there's no calculus in this first bit here. Um, and it's just kind of a matter of uh, a couple of observations, really. So uh, starting off, um, um, if we have this equation in polar coordinates, what does that look like in the xy plane? Um, and this one's a pretty easy one to start off with, r equals 3. Okay, well, we're looking at a bunch of points where the r-coordinate is 3, where the r-coordinate could be thought of as 3. Okay, theta equals Pi over 3. Okay, well, so a bunch of points that could be thought of as having theta coordinate uh, equal to pi over 3. It's uh, These are uh, first couple are pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, sometimes you get things that are a little weirder. Um, here's one that's a little weirder. Um, R equals sine 2 theta. Um, by the way, uh, I did a typo uh, on uh, some of these values here. I just spaced them. You know, sine of pi over 4, and somehow I got square root of 2. Square root of 2 over 2, of course. All right, so uh, anyway, what you can do is you can uh, just start plugging in points, right? This does not leap off the page at us, obviously, as of course being some, you know, uh, curve that we can just kind of, you know, just draw. Um, so uh, start plotting points. You plug in theta equal to 0, uh, and then uh, r ends up being 0, and that gives you a point. Right, then you think about uh, what happens if theta is pi over 8, for example. Well, plug that in. R ends up being square root of 2 over 2. And that gives you a point. Right, notice what I've plugged in here right, is with an angle of pi over 8. There's pi over 8. Right, and then I've gone a distance in that direction of square root of 2 over 2. Okay, um, repeat, right? Keep going. Uh, have di different uh, angles keep plugging in, and you get various points that move along as your angle increases. You keep track of these R's, um, and you keep getting more and more points. Now, we'll observe something uh, notable happens eventually. What if we're talking about values of theta that are more than pi over 2? Well, then we're taking sine of an angle that's more than pi. We're, we're going to get negative values of r, right? So it, it does get a little bit weird that, you know, for values of theta like this, if that's what we call, um, you know, our theta direction, our r's become negative. <laughs> and so, you know, in that direction, we go a negative amount. And so that has us actually back over here. Right, so be careful when you're plotting these points. You've got to think through the pluses and the minuses. Um, the neat punchline is that this particular curve does this weird thing. Uh, it makes a kind of a four-leaf clover. Oh, let me do that in green then. Uh, it makes kind of a four-leaf clover. And uh, I'm going to let you all uh, think through the rest of the details to plot that out. But it goes through and it does about like that. That's kind of neato, yes. Are these polar planes or Cartesian planes? Are these what? Are they polar coordinates? So, so these are, uh, we're in the xy plane here, right? So that's what's weird is, I mean, if, if you're plotting r as a function of theta in the r theta plane, then this is, just looks exactly like you would expect, right? But having a, an equation of polar coordinates and plotting it in the xy plane, that's why we get weird curves. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so... Um, that's one, one example. Here's another one. I'm going to let y'all um, uh, think through the details. And again, I uh, typoed some of these values. Sorry about that. 
Um, but uh, you can just go through one point at a time and just you know think about as these angles increase, uh, what are the corresponding you know what does this function do, uh, and plot the points and it ends up doing this weird uh, thing like that. Yes, how this one works out. So anyway, good example to uh, work through on your own. Okay. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, you can convert the equations. Now, th just a couple of quickies. Um, I'm not going to give you a here's what will always work sort of a method, but um, you know you can. It, uh, the big idea is take the equation as it stands and try to figure out how you can rewrite it in such a way that the polar expressions are easily observable to be convertible into rectangular expressions. So for example, this r equals 3, we looked at that equation on the previous page and we sort of, okay, well, I mean, it's easy. If r is the distance, you know, it's just pretty clearly a circle of radius 3. But if you hadn't noticed that, for whatever reason, note that if you square both sides of the equation, right, um, and then notice you've got r squared here, and we know that r squared is x squared plus y squared. So convenient punchline, I've converted a polar equation into a rectangular equation. Okay. Uh, likewise, here's another one. Uh, theta equals pi over 3. Take the tangent of both sides. And don't forget tan theta is y over x. And so that allows us, again, to convert into um, rectangular. Um, sometimes it's a little trickier. Now, there's a temptation here. You see the r, and it's tempting to square both sides. And then you're like, OK, cool, that r turns into r squared. But notice, had we squared both sides, then we'd have cosine squared theta. And that's not immediately recognizably a rectangular um, variable. So instead, just multiply both sides by r. You still get the r squared that you wanted on the left. But then on the right, uh, you get r cosine theta, which is recognizable. All right, so there's a certain amount of strategy, uh, you know, cleverness. There's a puzzle aspect to this game. So, um, By the way, I am aware that a lot of y'all uh, in your high school algebra classes uh, either were never shown how to complete the square, uh, or maybe you were, and then you've since forgotten because it's been a while, right? Uh, but uh, it's uh, one of these algebraic skills that I think it's important that everybody know how to do. It's not that hard, right? But uh, anyway, make sure that you remember uh, because that's one of the essential uh, tools required to convert that rectangular equation to this more recognizable rectangular equation where you can see the center of that and recognize it as a circle. Right. So, so like I say, neat trick. Uh, if you're not clear on how to complete the square, you, you can just like, probably find YouTube videos or something. I'm sure there's uh, easy explanations out there. Um, but if you'd like, of course, you're very welcome to come to my office hours, and I can show you how that, how that works. It's no big deal. Okay, this next example is a little weird. Um, this is, uh, I just want to show you uh, how sometimes uh, neat things work out. This is just a clever move. It's a tool for your toolbox. You know, look for opportunities. This is a hard example, by the way. Uh, but suppose you have a rectangular equation, you want to write it in polar coordinates, which, by the way, we're going to need to do uh, going on uh, later in the in the, today's lecture, in fact. Um, well, you can take this and you can kind of square it all out, and uh, this turns into this without too much trouble. Okay. X squared plus Y squared is R squared. No problem. These terms go over to the other side. No big deal, right? Um, and then I've done this weird thing with these numbers. I've taken the 2 root 3 and the 2, and I kind of put them sort of here, but then I factored out a factor of 4. Right Now, how I knew to do that, we'll talk about in a moment. But let me point out that having done that mysteriously, right? notice that this now takes the form of an angle addition formula. Do you all remember your angle addition formulas? Um, I, I say rhetorically. I'm, I'm aware of the fact that most of you all have either not ever been required to memorize or have since forgotten the angle addition formulas for sine and cosine. I, I, I think this is a mistake on the part of uh, high schools to let that slide. Uh, these are really important. They come up a lot, uh, especially those of you who are engineers. 
Uh, it's a big deal. Um, you're going to hear me give a speech about that, if, for those of you who are engineers, uh, in Math 216. Uh, it is, uh, they come up a lot in Math 216. So they are required uh, for you to know. So you might as well know them now, uh, especially if you're engineers. But anyway, angle addition formulas allow you to turn that expression into cosine of theta minus pi over 6. It's a neat fact. Um, um, okay, so uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, uh, follow up on the details if you're not entirely comfortable with how that turned into that. Okay, all right. Okay, so how did I know to do this, uh, to sort of pull out this factor of four? Where did that little slick move come from? And the idea was, uh, I, I thought to myself, well, look, I, you know, before I ha before I had done so, let me scratch off this four. Right, and then uh, we'll scratch off that, and that's a two, and we'll scratch off uh, this. That's a two. So now I I look at this and I think, wow, wouldn't it be nice if these numbers were cosine and sine of an angle? Wouldn't that be cool? If the, you know what, if those things I had highlighted in green, if those were cosine and sine of an angle, then I could use an angle addition formula and simplify this equation really nicely. Tragically, they are not cosine and sine of an angle that which I have highlighted in green right now. And the reason you know is because you can, if they were cosine and sine of an angle, we would have sine squared plus cosine squared equaling one. And it's easily computable that these things I have highlighted in green, the sum of their squares is not one. The sum of their squares is easily seen to be um, uh, 16. Um, and so uh, the, if you will, magnitude of uh, this, uh, this thing that should have magnitude 1 is uh, 4. And if you want it to not have magnitude 4 anymore, then just factor out the 4 like this. And now that's a cosine and that's a sine. So that's the little argument. That's the, the rationale. I will admit it's a slick move. Right? But nevertheless, uh, you're allowed to do slick moves, and sometimes slick moves will be helpful to you. So um, think through how you can uh, see, you know, see the big idea on this, and feel free to take advantage of that in the future. Okay. All right, hard example. Okay, so that's polar coordinates. Let's talk about cylindrical coordinates. Um, it's um, pretty much polar coordinates in R3. A lot of people call cylindrical coordinates polar coordinates in R3, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. Um, it's a little different, not terribly different. Uh, the big idea is if you have a point in R3, the coordinates x, y, and z, um, you can just look at its shadow down in the x, y plane. That shadow has a theta and an r. All right? <laughs> so, uh, and then furthermore, the original point had a z. Let's just use that same z, and now we've got three numbers that are highly reminiscent of polar coordinates, right? We've got r, theta, and z, and in the same way that x, y, and z describe the location of a point in space, well, r, theta, z describe the location of a point in space also. Yeah? How do you know which angle Oh, well, I mean, it's just the same story with polar coordinates. You've got options. I mean, you know, one thing you could do, I suppose, is uh, view the angle as being like that, right? You've still got that flexibility, but I'm just saying, you know, interpret theta as, you know, start going counterclockwise from the positive part of the x-axis, just like in polar coordinates. Yeah, and then you've got all the same, um, you know, uh, flexibility, if you want to say it in a positive way, or uniqueness problems, if you want to say it in a negative way. Yeah, totally. Okay, so no surprise, because r and theta are, you know, pretty much the same in the xy plane as, uh, as polar coordinates. No surprise that we have these old formulas from polar coordinates. It's still true. Okay, and of course, you don't need to convert the z-coordinate. It's the same z-coordinate in both. Not a lot to say about cylindrical coordinates. It's it's pull coordinates with an added Z attached. Okay, a couple of examples. Um, uh, the name cylindrical coordinates motivated by the fact that the cylindrical equation um, R equals 1, a super, super duper simple equation is the equation of a cylinder. 
Um, uh, a sphere. Uh, you can rewrite the equation of a sphere in cylindrical coordinates by just plugging in that identity. And so, you know, it's a, it's a different equation, but uh, nevertheless, there it is. Okay, all right, not, not that much more to say about it. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about, those spherical coordinates. There is a lot to say about spherical coordinates. Um, it is also common for students to refer to spherical coordinates as polar coordinates in R3. I think that's a mistake. Um, it's is right or wrong, but it's, I think it's misleading. Right? It's very different from polar coordinates. It has something in common with polar coordinates, yes, but uh, it's sufficiently different that I encourage you to try to distance yourself. When you're thinking about spherical coordinates, don't think about polar coordinates. It's going to make you think cylindrically, not spherically. Right, so I reserve. I suggest reserving. You know, the connect thinking about polar coordinates um, in the cylindrical context. Okay. All right. So here's a big idea. Uh, if you have a point uh, with rectangular coordinates x, y, and z, notice that we can describe that in a different way. Here's how we do it. Um, that point is in a plane hinged on the z-axis. In fact, let's call that a half plane uh, hinged on the z-axis there. Okay. Um, you can describe the direction from the origin to get to that point in that plane by way of a couple of angles. Uh, on the one hand, there's the angle Okay, well, the, here's the connection to polar coordinates. It's the angle theta, right? It's the cyl cyl cylindrical um, or, if you prefer, um, polar angle theta. Right? That tells you how to get to that half plane or, or, if you like, the projection of the point down to the xy plane. Um, but then you can also describe that direction by, well, how far off of the z-axis do you have to rotate down? From the positive part of the z-axis uh, to get to uh, to get to that direction. So there, so we're going to describe the location of this point with two directions, and then lastly, uh, we're going to describe uh, the distance from the origin. Now, very importantly, this distance from the origin is not r. Right? R is uh, this thing down here. That's r. That blue distance is not R. Everybody good? Make sure to see the difference between R and this new, this new distance that uh, uh, we represent with the Greek letter rho. Okay, now let me poke fun at myself a little bit. I did something goofy when I was writing these notes. Um, I wrote, uh, this is the Greek letter rho, and then I wanted to be helpful and uh, indicate that, okay, well, by the way, this is the Greek letter rho, and here's how you say rho, right? And then I, likewise, um, <laughs> I, I wrote phi here, and then with the intent of being helpful, um, I wanted to help students understand. And so in my mind, I was writing phi when I wrote that, but of course, that's not helpful. <laughs> that was just brain, you know, sort of, I, I just, nah, um, oops. So anyway, just let me write that out um, more helpfully. Uh, this is um, phi. So lowercase Greek letter phi. Okay. I leave this in here despite it being useless because I find it hilarious at this point. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, but uh, let's scratch that off for, for now. Um, okay, so that's uh, phi, and of course you all know what theta is. Right. Okay. So rho phi and theta are the spherical coordinates. Um, good news, there's uh, conversion formulas, uh, you know, relationship between rectangular coordinates and spherical coordinates. They are pretty familiar, really. Um, uh, easy way to see them is to recognize that this, uh, oops, that this distance here, r, of course we know r is useful, um, that I can write it in terms of spherical coordinates by thinking about this right triangle. Uh, so this distance here, that r, uh, keeping in mind that if that angle is phi, then so is that angle also phi. And then you just look at this yellow triangle, 
and think about basic trig and that green distance R um, missed is uh, rho sine phi. Right? So um, the good news is once you make that one observation, just you know, think about that little triangle and basic trig and R is rho sine phi, then you are you have already memorized two of the three equations for spherical uh, for converting from spherical to rectangular coordinates. Uh, namely, our old friends, x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta. Right? That's literally what these say. So um, I strongly encourage you to memorize the equations uh, from this point of view. Um, let me recognize, just for your consideration, uh, I have actually never memorized these equations in the sense of, you know, I just rattled them off. I, I do not trust myself to keep it straight. Oh, gosh, is it, is it, is it rho sine phi or is it rho cosine phi? Which one is it? I, I will get that wrong at some point, right? Every single time that I need these equations, I think about this picture. And I think, okay, well, it's a triangle that way, so, okay, so it's sine. Right? It takes me a second and a half right, to think about that picture and therefore get it right reliably every time. Okay, so I, that's, what, again, what I encourage uh, for you all to do as well. Okay, uh, now likewise from that same triangle, uh, you can also see um, the Z coordinate. Right here's the Z coordinate, uh, and that Z coordinate uh, from the same triangle is uh, is rho cosine phi. Okay. All righty, a um, couple other quickie obs quickie observations. Um, this is easily observed, right? Or if you want to think about the connection to cylindrical coordinates for whatever reason, uh, rho squared is that also. Yeah. Where is the right triangle and the like? Y plane that like allows you to use cosine theta. Oh yeah, 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 sure. Uh, so once we once you give me that this is R, right, then uh, that right triangle right there is what gives you uh, X and Y as in terms of R and theta. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same uh, right triangle that we uh, talked about doing polar coordinates and also cylindrical coordinates. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, so here's where it gets weird. Um, they, like polar coordinates, are not unique. Right? And uh, it just gets really geometrically challenging <laughs> to see the, the non-uniqueness. I mean, in polar coordinates, it's all, it's, for, for one thing, it's two-dimensional. Polar coordinates is two-dimensional. You're looking right at it. Right? There's no perspective problems when you're looking at polar coordinates, and it's just easy to see, oh, yeah, half turn, right? full turn. It's... it's not that uh, not that geometrically rough. This gets a little geometrically rough. Um, so, as a for example, um, here is a point uh, with uh, rectangular coordinates. And I, by the way, I made a, a decision as I was making this example and uh, forgot to change um, the uh, the original statement here. So, I think when I was writing the lecture notes this day, I had a lot of typos in this uh, today. So, when I was writing this, I was just I don't know, must have been tired or something. Uh, but anyway, so please make that correction y is equal to 1. So uh, with that, uh, we've got this point here with x square root of 3, y is 1, z is 2. And there's that point. And let's think about how to describe that now in spherical coordinates. Well, uh, it's a matter of drawing the right picture. Um, this point sits directly above that point, which you might say helps me define that half plane hinged on the z-axis. And, you know, you can uh, play through some basic trig and some basic uh, geometry and confirm that that distance is 2. And uh, since this height is 2, uh, that tells you that this angle here is pi over 4. Uh, and, of course, 30, 60, 90 triangles and all that. This angle is pi over 6. Now, that's that's uh, that's old. That's just, you know, geometry, regular geometry, right? So, now, how do we use that, though, to take advantage of this, uh, to write this in spherical coordinates? Well, I'm going to observe that I can think, then, of pi over 6 as being my theta. 
Of course, it's an angle, so you can always say plus any integer multiple of two pi. Right? Now, that's true for all angles, so I'm gonna it, it, I'm gonna put it in there. I'm gonna it's, it, it's there in writing, and I'm gonna stop saying it because it's true for all angles. And so, you know. <coughs> Um, okay, and then I can think of the phi angle, you know, in that half plane defined by that value of theta. I can think of phi angle. Again, we've already done the trig. I know that angle is pi over 4, and so phi pi over 4. And then in the direction defined by that phi and that theta, in that direction, and again, I've already done the, uh, the geometry, that distance row is 2 root 2. So, now, that's not that bad, right? I mean, you got to be able to draw a picture geometrically, make good decisions about the drawing. Again, I remind you, if you're not really good at drawing, watch those videos, please, um, that I have on my YouTube channel. And then also, uh, practice. I give it time. Um, drawing competently, not beautifully. That's not a beautiful picture. That's a competent picture, right? But being able to draw competently um, does take some, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill. It takes chops, right? you got to actually develop and practice and um, work up to it. Okay. All right. So here's where it gets weird. Um, let's uh, see the, uh, the non-uniqueness. There are different ways to think of this point in polar coordinates. And uh, this is, I mean, this really is going to, this is going to exercise your three-dimensional visualization, right? So um, rather than thinking of this as being in that half plane, let's think, what if I went around an extra half turn, right? And so then I would be in that half plane that's swung around sort of halfway, you know, sort of away from us there. All right, so now bear with me, <laughs> all right? So I'm going to say theta is 7 pi over 6. That's what that extra half turn would get me to, all right? So there's my half plane. That means that off of the z-axis, um, that's the direction of my positive phi, right? So phi always comes down from the z-axis in the direction indicated by theta. Well, theta is going back there, so phi is going, that, the positive phi is go that way. So if I want to go that way by pi over 4, that's actually negative pi over 4. You gotta kind of visualize, and you might even look. I mean, you know, feel free to make a little three-dimensional, you know, thing and do like this, and, and you know, take the time to, you know. But um, anyway, there you go, negative pi over four. And now, of course, having done that, uh, that does give us the same direction that we, uh, whoops, that we were talking about previously. It still gets us going in that same direction, right? And in that direction. If I want to get to that point, well, I have to go that same distance, 2 root 2. All right. So that's a second way to get to that same point in polar coordinates, um, but uh, sort of in a different polar way, a uh, spherical way. All right. Now, the last two I'm going to let you all uh, think through on your own, um, but uh, they happen with negative rows, right? And so... What we're going to do is end up with the angles. We're going to define that direction, and then you know, sort of the direction that's opposite from the way we want to go. And then, of course, in that direction, we're going backwards. Thus, the negatives on the distance. But I want you all to think through how is that direction defined by these phi and thetas over here. So it's good mental exercise. Good uh, sort of um, geometric. Weightlifting. Uh, so um, think these uh, think these through. And as always, if you have any questions, come to office hours and we can talk about it. Okay. All righty. Um, here's a neat trick. Uh, I like this one a lot. This is a cool thing that you can do with spherical coordinates. This is an easy application that while we're here, uh, let me go ahead and show you. Um, so... Um, 
first just a, a, a an easy observation, and that is that uh, when you're on the surface of the Earth and you talk about longitude and latitude, it's not that different from spherical angles. If you just think about um, what uh, angles look like on the surface of the Earth, here's uh, here's the surface of the Earth, and let's say here's the equator, like that, and then here's a um, I guess that's the prime meridian, right? That's where longitude equals zero. And notice that what we call theta, right? In the XYZ axis system that you see there, what we call theta in spherical coordinates, that's just east longitude, right? And then uh, what we call phi, Well, that's not the same as latitude, right? Latitude is measured up from the equator. Phi is measured down from the North Pole, so they're not the same, right? But uh, north latitude and spherical phi, they always add up to pi over 2, right? I mean, that's look at how they're defined, and they add up to pi over 2. So if you know uh, longitude and latitude... Then, uh, you know, you, uh, in effect, no spherical coordinates, or at least the spherical angles. And then I'll observe that uh, neat fact about the surface of the Earth. Um, it's uh, pretty much a sphere. Not exactly. Not, it, it, interesting fact, by the way. I don't know if you all are aware of this, but the, 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 because of the fact that the Earth is rotating, right, there's a certain amount of centrifugal force. And the Earth, it's solid, kind of, but not really. There's actually a lot of liquid involved. Um, and so, uh, anyway, punchline is the Earth is actually... Something like 20 miles um, has a, tr a. When you're at the equator, you're something like 20 miles further from the center of the Earth than when you're at the North Pole. Right. So anyway, curious fact. But for the for the purposes of quickie calculations, uh, we can view uh, the radius of the Earth as being pretty much constant, and it averages out to about that. Four thousand is pretty close. Okay. So. Um, if you know longitude and latitude, you know spherical coordinates. So why do we care about that? Well, um, if you know spherical coordinates, right, longitude and latitude give me spherical coordinates. If you know spherical coordinates, now you know rectangular coordinates. Those are easy conversions on the previous page. If you know rectangular coordinates... That means that when you're in two different uh, locations, or if you talk about two different locations on the surface of the Earth, maybe that point, you know its rectangular coordinates, x1. And this point here on the surface of the Earth, think, thought of as a vector, you know its rectangular coordinates. It's real easy to do the dot product. Right? Super easy calculation to do the dot product. And we know that these magnitudes are the radius of the Earth. And so it's just a very direct and easy calculation to find this angle. This is what we're working up to. That angle is easy to compute. The angle as measured from the center of the Earth between two points. And who could possibly have any use for the angle as measured from the center of the Earth? I'm not going to the center of the Earth. Right? But the big win is in the fact that uh, if you know that angle, right, then you can find this distance, the distance along the surface of the Earth uh, between two, two points. And that is otherwise a very difficult calculation. If you think about it, I mean, how else would you compute the distance from two points uh, between two points on the surface of the Earth? I mean, after all, you look at the map, right? Maps are routinely Mercator projections, right, in which everything down here is uh, Antarctica, <laughs> right? When you're on Antarctica, that point and that point that looks so far away, no, nah, they're actually really close because, you know, the Earth is actually curved. Right, and so you might think, okay, that's not that hard to deal with. But uh, what, where it gets really hard to deal with is if you want to talk about these two points. You want to talk about the distance between those two points. It's hard, and part of the reason that it's hard is that what I just drew there. I uh, hmm. okay, sorry. Let me get out of Antarctica. 
far away. Um, when you're between two points like that, um, the close, the the the, uh, the distance between these two points, the the shortest path from that point to that point is not on the map going to look like a straight line. It's actually going to arc a little bit. After all, distances near the poles are shorter. They're literally shorter um, than they look on the map. Right? So how do you compute the length of some arc? What is that arc? What's the ideal arc as seen on the Mercator projection? How, what is that ideal arc? Oh, this seems like a really hard problem. Right? And the point is, you're just thinking about it the wrong way. Mercator projections are terrible for this particular problem. Um, and um, yeah, the shortest distance is clearly this arc of a great circle, which is easily computed by the angle, which is easily computed by the dot product, which is easily computed from longitude and latitude. So, neat fact. Thank you, spherical coordinates, making that possible. Okay. All right. Um, I just think that's a neat application. Um, last quick comment, and then we'll get on to some calculus, uh, and that is um, uh, converting uh, equations. Now, we, we did polar coordinates versions of these kinds of things. I just want to point out that morally the same kind of process works in spherical coordinates. So if you have this rectangular equation and you want to convert to spherical coordinates, we're going to need to do this, by the way. This is going to be a big deal. Right? Um, you know, go ahead. Um, multiply it out. Notice that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. Um, x is rho sine phi cosine theta, right? Again, think about the geometry formulas a couple pages back. Um, and therefore, uh, you can solve for rho, and now you've got a spherical equation for that um, previously rectangular surface. So, same thing, right? Very analogous to the uh, uh, that kind of thing that we did in, rect in uh, polar coordinates. All right, so um, let me remind you, going way back, one of the first things that I said about polar coordinates is that we're going to think of polar coordinates as a function. All right, think of as a function. From the r theta plane, think of the r theta plane as a separate world over there, right? To the x, y plane, thought of as a separate world over here. All right, so going back to that perspective, um, yeah, what does that remind you of, right? A function that goes from R2 to R2, and th it just cosmetically even, that looks just like the, f the pictures that we were drawing when we were doing change of variables. So I make the modest observation that this these uh, these formulas that we use to convert from polar to rectangular, we've been thinking of them as a function. As such, you can think of them as a change of variables function. Right, there it is. So, um, I mean, when we were doing change of variables, it was like, well, you know, maybe u's and v's, but uh, whatever. They're just variables. You can use whatever variables you want. And... <coughs> Um, I can think of this as a change of variables function. Now, arguably, we're putting the cart before the horse a little bit here. Um, normally, we wait until we actually have a domain, something over here, some, well, probably not a rectangle, right, some uh, undesirable domain. And then we ask, what should the uh, change of variables function be? Uh, we're doing this a little bit backwards, but here's the nice punchline. This is going to be the right answer. For a lot of cases, there are just lots and lots and lots of domains over here, right, for which that's a great choice as a change of variables function. Okay, so we're going to study it, and we're not going to we're not going to worry about what domain yet. We'll get to that. We'll get to some of the many examples um, uh, soon. But I just want to first talk about this as a change of variables function. Um, Got to compute the stretching factor. There's the formula for it. All right, Jacobian determinant, absolute value. 
So you've got to take a couple of partial derivatives. Uh, make sure you can do those. Take these various partial derivatives. Right. Compute the determinant. Pythagorean identity jumps up. How nice. Um, and uh, what you get very quickly, nice, compact, pithy answer. It's the absolute value of R. Which I can simplify even more. Um, I'm just going to insist that from here on out, let's choose polar coordinates where R is never negative. Let's impose that requirement on ourselves, And with that imposition made, absolute value of R is now just R. So our stretching factor is now super compact, super convenient. It's just R. By the way, um, this is a uh, kind of a win-win sort of a deal. Normally, you know, there's kind of a cost, sort of a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, well, if I, if I tie my hands in this way, then I get the following benefit. Right? Here, it's sort of the opposite. Here, it's if I uh, choose to do what I strongly prefer anyway, right? I mean, we all prefer <laughs> positive values of R. It's just more kind of geometrically natural and comforting and satisfying to think of R's as being positive. It gets weird when you start thinking of negative R's. So if we do what we wanted to do anyway, then we get an additional benefit of I don't have to worry about absolute values. It's a total win-win. Okay. All right. That said, it is a constraint. You are required. If you're going to use um, this uh, function as a change of variables function and if you want to use that as the stretching factor, you are stuck now. You have to use positive values of R. You cannot use negative values of R without uh, reintroducing the absolute values and thus creating problems. So, heads up. Okay, okay so um, here's what you can do then. Uh, here's a, a, just a, 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 an easy for example. Um, suppose our domain in the xy plane is this. Right, that's a pretty weird shape. Uh, it, this is, uh, you know, part of, in the xy plane, part of what's between that circle and that circle, specifically the part that's between that line through the origin and that line through the origin. So I get this uh, kind of, mm, certainly, from a rectangular slicing point of view, this bad domain, right? Think about how you'd slice this up. It's It's horrifying, right? I mean, starting there, slices, slice through a corner continue, slice through another corner, continue, right? So you'd, you'd have to slice this up into uh, three separate pieces. That'd be a bummer. Right. Okay, so let's think about this from the point of view of R and theta. Um, and I appeal to your uh, geometric uh, intuition, but this equation R equals a certain constant R1 is easy to draw in the R theta plane. Con R equals a constant. It's going to be a line perpendicular to the R axis. Uh, likewise, this equation here easy to draw. Right? Um, going the other way, uh, this line right here, that's where theta is a certain constant, so easy to draw. And uh, that line there, uh, easy to draw, right? So not hard to see that the pullback domain is going to be that rectangle, right? So we can uh, talk about an integral on this undesirable domain. Think about it. Think about pulling it back through the polar coordinates change of variables function. It's just literally a pullback, just like all the other change of variables that we did. Uh, and now we have an integral over this much nicer domain. It's a rectangle, and I can uh, just use, you know, slice this up in the usual way, and uh, constant bounds, uh, no sweat, nothing to it. Okay. All right. Um, there's a little bit more to say. Um, it is almost true to say that integrals in polar coordinates are just change of variables 
end of story. That's almost true. There is a little bit more to it. Um, the, 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 this is a good thing, not a bad thing. The additional more to it is that there is a convenient way to see the bounds. Um, and uh, let me walk you through the idea there. Um, if I were doing my theta slicing on the outside, my first slice you can see right there, theta starts at theta 1, whatever that constant value is, and then I do my theta slicing. Right, and then my last slice is going to be there at this value, theta 2. So I can think in terms of, you know, writing as I write down my integral, right, I can think of, well, my, my theta bounds are clearly theta 1 to theta 2 per this picture. And I make the uh, cool observation that, yeah, sure, okay, you can do that, but notice these lines, these bounds, this line right here that gives me my lower bound of theta as being theta 1, I can see it over here too. And likewise, this line that gives me my upper bound for theta as being theta 2, I can see it over here too. So I don't even really need to draw that picture. Right? I mean, the, the picture of the, the pullback domain, it's a nice picture. I like rectangles, but why draw an additional picture when I already have right? I already have a picture that I've already got. I'm already dealing with this picture. Why not just use what I've already got? I can see right there that that is my lower bound and that is my upper bound. You can just see it in your original picture. So to say this a little bit more pithily, um, you can see your polar bounds in the rectangular picture. You just have to make sure that you're clear what those slices look like. Right? What we very comfortably recognize over here as being a theta slice, because I'm slicing right perpendicular to the theta axis, just make sure you understand that theta slices look like rays coming out of the origin when you're in the xy plane. That's all there is to it. Um, and then uh, likewise, let's talk about the, you know, for a given value of theta. So here's a, you know, an arbitrary value of theta right there. And uh, there's going to be an R1, and there's going to be an R2. Well, again, you can, if you really want to draw that new picture, I suppose you could, but why would you want to go to that trouble? All of that information is right here on this picture looking at you. For some value of theta, somewhere between theta 1 and theta 2. Right? There's your starting value of r. It's on this curve that has that equation. I can see it right there in my xy plane picture. And my ending value of r, well, it's right there. I can see it. It's on that curve with that equation right here in this picture. So again, I don't really need the pullback picture at all. So in practice, when people do integrals you know, in polar coordinates, all they're doing is doing this pullback change of variables, but just not drawing the pullback. You just don't draw it. It's there. You just don't draw it. You don't need to draw it. Everything you need from it, you can see in the xy plane. OK, so here's, a, here's an example. Uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, I, gotta, I, gotta, I can do this. Uh, so let's suppose that you uh, look at this quarter disk. Here in the xy plane, well, look, you can do the pull. If you want to write the pullback, you can, right? I mean, this line, theta equals zero. Okay, that's that. And uh, this line here, theta equals pi over two. Okay. And uh, this curve here, r equals one. Fine, you can draw that. And then it's not hard to persuade yourself that um, that point right there, r equals zero. Well, that's part of the boundary too, and so. We'll R equals zero. So you can draw the pullback domain. You can see it's a rectangle. Fine, I get it. if you really want to do that, but you just don't need to, right? Everything you need to see, you can see right here in the rectangular picture. Theta goes from zero to pi over two. You can see it right there in the picture. There are those bounds, zero and pi over two. And then for a given fixed value of theta, whatever that value of theta is between 0 and pi over 2, 
Um, R starts at zero. R ends on that curve, which is a circle that was the unit circle, so R equals one. Right, so again, you can see right there on the picture what the R bounds are. And we don't need this picture at all. Okay, um, don't forget your stretching factor. I'll say more about this next time. But uh, dx dy is r dr d theta. There's that stretching factor that we computed of r. And you got yourself a new integral in polar coordinates. Y'all have a great Monday. See y'all on uh, Wednesday.